Welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that you're at Life Church this morning. Uh, if you're watching online, we're glad that you're here. Maybe you're watching in Plentywood, Montana, or Crosby, North Dakota. Maybe in Watford City, we broadcast and air our services uh, at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings on KUMV Channel 8. And uh, you can watch us online as well. So we're glad that you're tuned in. We're glad that you're here this morning. What an amazing group of people you are. This is the best-looking gathering of people in the whole city of Williston. Would you agree with me? That's, that's right. I know some of you are so humble, it's like, we can't agree with that. That's just, that's just wrong. I started a series with you a couple of weeks ago. We're continuing today as we talk about believing for more in 2014. I want to encourage you that when you combine your efforts and the abilities that God has put inside of you with a limitless ability and possibilities of God, it is amazing what can happen. I'm telling you that with God, all things are possible. And where we live and where we exist, however, is living between doubt, between doubt and desire. We, we, there's things that we want to do. We live between faith and we live between fear. It's between decision and doubt. There are things in our lives we know we need to do. We need to stretch. We need to grow. We need to walk confidently and by faith in the presence of God. And yet we know and understand to do that in the area of finances and relationships and personal habits and personal growth. It is difficult sometimes for us to do. My hope and desire is this, that, that if I was together with this exact same group of people next year in the month of January, that individually and corporately we are not the same church next year as we are this Sunday morning, that there has been enough spiritual growth in our lives over the next 12 months that we individually are different, and corporately when we come together, Life Church is a different church. We have a lot of amazing opportunities that lay before us in the months ahead as we look to raise money to build a building, but it's not a building that we're going to build. All we're doing is investing in a tool to invest in the lives of our community. We're just looking ahead to change the lives of individuals and families, and we we just recognize that we have an opportunity right now to reach into the lives of people to do this, not only with building a building, but, but building a, a church plant, starting a whole other service. It's never about brick and mortar. It's always about what happens inside of the brick and mortar. Let me tell you, I, I could just enumerate for you the thousands of lives that have been changed as a result of this building. Uh, years ago, more than 30 years ago, there was a dream and a plan in a group of men and women that were leading this church to raise this building and to raise the money to build this building. And I want to tell you, as a result of this building and this little boy walking into the back of this church, accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, you never know what's going to happen. But if the building wasn't here, it wouldn't have happened either. So I'm telling you, we're investing in lives as we look ahead to the future. Now, none of that was even in my sermon notes this morning, so it's going to be a really long sermon. All right, there you go. So uh, I want to talk about where we live in this, this place between decision and doubt. When we live in the places between faith and fear, we, we know what it is to feel afraid. And none of us likes the emotion of fear. We just don't even want to camp out there. So what we tend to do in our personal lives is, is we, we, just, we, we leverage our lives in such a way that we can live as safe as possible. We want to live as comfortable as we possibly can. We don't want anything to rock our boat. We don't want drastic changes. We want our house to be a certain way, our family to be a certain way, our finances to be a certain way. We want our lifestyle to be a certain way. And all of it, all of it, we leverage so that we are in control and we can be absolutely safe. But my challenge to you this morning is this, that the safest place in your life isn't always the best place to be in your life. That the safest place isn't always the best place. There's a lot of things that we can do that we can either spectate or participate. I'm telling you, when I lived in Iowa many years ago, there was a lot of people that went hot air ballooning. And I, I would watch the hot air balloonists, and I thought, I, I would love to be a part of that whole thing. And so I joined a balloon crew, and you go out and chase the balloon, the whole thing. And it was an amazing thing to stand beneath this hot air balloon and watch as this thing begins to fill with the warm air. And that balloon, the first time, it just ruffles up and pops. And you're standing there at the base of this thing in awe. It is just an incredible sight. And the basket is there, and you hear that, that loud, just the flame, brrr, just as it's going up there, filling up that, that balloon with hot air. And then, and then there's the sick feeling you have as you watch other people have fun and float off into the sky, you know? I want to be the one that's in that basket. It, if I don't really have a bucket list, but it's always been a longing of mine to ride in a hot air balloon. I, I just think, rather than just watch it, I, I would rather participate in it. Uh, also, you know, uh, another example, you're saying, all right, well, the hot air balloon, I'm not going to go for that. That's scary. Uh, guys, let me talk to you this. You can either watch the Outdoor Channel, or you can go get yourself a gun and get into the woods and shoot something, right? 
You can either spectate or participate. It really depends on your perspective on things. Let's not just play it safe all the time. I, years ago when I was here uh, serving as an intern, 1993, I know it's a lifetime ago, isn't it? 1993, my wife had gone to South Dakota to see her family, and I'm here alone, and I was interning at the church. Um, an air taxi service out here at the airport ran a promotional. You could get an airplane ride for 10 bucks. It was an incredible thing. For 10 bucks, you could go ride in this, this little airplane. Well, 10 bucks was a fortune to me back then, and, uh, but I did it anyway. I sacrificed the $10. I rode my bike out to the airport and uh, waited around, paid my 10 bucks, and the pilot says, we'll follow. We're, we're, we need three guys in there. So there'll be four of us in the plane, but I don't know. They, they, for whatever reason, didn't get that other person. So he tells me and one other guy, just follow me. Come on out here. So we walk out onto the out onto the tarmac. It was awesome. And the guy that's with me, he's carrying a camera bag. I've never seen a guy in my life. And we jump into this airplane. I get into the front seat. So I'm in the passenger side. The pilot's over here. And then there's this guy in the back. Fires up the engine. I'm thinking, I'm going to ride in an airplane. This is so cool. Not like a jet where you can't see the ground. This is an airplane. We're going to fly around the city and look at stuff. I was excited. So engine roars up. We start taxiing out tarmac. We get out in the runway. And the pilot looks over at me. And he says, now, um, when... When we get up to 70 miles an hour, I want you to pull back on this thing, and you're going to fly the plane. No! I said, wait, wait. I said, no, 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 no. I'm blind. Um, I don't even have a driver's license. I don't even, I can't even drive a car. I kind of looked in the back seat, and the guy back there is doing this number. I mean, he's, he's just... And I'm supposed to fly the plane. The pilot says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just grab a hold of this thing. And I'll just call out the speed to you. And when it gets to 70, just pull back on this thing. You can fly the plane. <sighs> No, I said, no, I can't fly. I'm blind. I can't even see the speedometer. No, don't worry about it. I'll just call out the numbers to you. So, you know, 50, 55, 60, 60, get to 70, and I pull back on that thing. Up we go, and then we crashed and burned. It was great. We took off in the air. I thought I, I never dreamed of flying an airplane. I just wanted to ride in an airplane. And here I'm flying the plane. It says, all right, now when you see the horizon up there, just, just push down a little bit until you see the horizon just over the nose. So I did that. You don't believe me, because, see, maybe you're new, you've never been here before. I'm visually challenged or visually impaired or legally blind. Take your pick, all right? So, Darren, way back in the back row, you could be making a face at me. I don't care. I can't see it anyway. So, anyway, uh, as it goes, we're flying the plane. So, all right, now bank off to the left. I said, look, you fly the plane. I want to look out the window. To which the guy in the back seat's like, Whew, you know. So, that's the way that whole thing. And it was so much f more fun to participate than to just spectate. But in order to do that, sometimes we have to make difficult decisions, scary decisions. I like this quote by Theodore Roosevelt. Maybe you've read this before. I'm going to put it up here for you because it's kind of long. But I love what Theodore Roosevelt said. Here's what he said. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. No, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who, uh, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while, while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat." I think what Theodore Roosevelt was saying is, you know what? It is better to fail at trying something than to fail at doing nothing. I used to work for a guy that said that I would rather see you fail trying something than to do nothing at all because if you fail trying something, I know that you're growing and you're learning. And I'm going to challenge you from the Word of God this morning with an individual, with a very prominent individual in the, in, in the Bible, that there are times when we look at an individual's life and we might see them as a failure, but you know what? They tried they did something. They moved out of the place of safety and security. And we like to play it safe in our spiritual lives and in our natural lives. And I'm going to challenge you this morning that if you'll take that step of faith, you are going to discover more about yourself and about the character and the nature of God than you've ever, ever discovered before. That's where we want to go this morning. And there's a great story to illustrate this. And I want you to know that our places of safety in our personal lives looks different for every one of us. We play it safe. We, we like to pad things in such a way that we, we, we're not going to get bumped. We're not going to get bruised. We're not going to get challenged. We're not going to get scared. 
See, for you, some of your places of safety today, your place of safety, your place of safety for you, the place where you want to play it safe instead of taking the challenge is, um, it's conformity. Let me speak to students a little bit this morning. You know what? I, I understand where you're at. It's conformity. You don't want to look any different than anybody else that you attend school with. So for you, your place of safety is conformity. It's not really who you are because you're a different person when you're by yourself at home. You're a different person in church. You're a different person in youth group. And you're a different person in school. You'll try to fit in wherever you, wherever you can because for you, conformity, conforming to the norms and the expectations, that is your place of safety. I get it. I understand the pressure because it doesn't go away when you're an adult. There's people that have told me, Pastor, why is it sometimes so much easier to worship in a different church than in my own? I think it's because we're afraid. We're afraid of what people will think if they see us worship different than they've always seen us worship on a Sunday morning. For some of you, your place of safety is in the bank account. You know what it is to come through the hard times and the difficult times. You've lived with nothing. You watched your parents live with nothing. So you understand that. And so your whole thing is about having enough in the bank account just in case. And my question is this. Well, how do you know when you have enough or when you don't have enough, you know? For some of you, you know what? It's your dad. Your dad is a place of safety. You hang everything on your dad. If anything would happen to dad, your whole life would fall apart. For some of you, it's your title. For some of you, it might be a job. It might be the town that you're living in. Some of you know what it is to get out of a place of safety. You move from someplace else and here you are in Williston, North Dakota. I just want you to know that when you're in Williston and you ever try to get a hold of God, it's a local call because this is where he lives, right? All right, so. All right? I'm going to challenge you today to grow, to step away from the places of safety in your life and put more trust in God than you've ever done before. And there's times when you might take that step of faith, you might start to move towards God because he's given you the invitation. There's something inside of you that God is spurring inside of there. He's nudging you along. He's inviting you on this journey. But you are rationalizing it all in your mind why it shouldn't work, why you don't want to do it, why it shouldn't happen and it can't happen that way and it can't happen yet. You can argue with God all you want to. I'll tell you who's going to win. Okay? Just doesn't work. So this morning, we're going to look at a story of a guy that that, that did what I'm going to challenge you to do. And some might look at his life as a failure, like he failed in the attempt. But I don't think he did. If you want to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 14, you'll find Matthew. It's that first book in the New Testament part of your Bible, Matthew chapter 14. Let me give you a little bit of a backdrop to the story this morning before we get into this. We're going to talk about a famous guy named Peter. And uh, we're going to talk about Peter and the disciples. There was 12 guys that followed Jesus wherever he went. That's why they were called disciples. And he was the rabbi. He was the teacher. And the disciple didn't want to know what the teacher knew. He wanted to become as the teacher was. And in order to do that, they spent all their time with the rabbi and with the teacher. As we pick up uh, the, the life of Jesus in Matthew chapter 14, here's what's going on. John the Baptist. Maybe you've heard about John the Baptist. If you haven't, John was a cousin to Jesus. He was really the forerunner to Jesus and went out and really preached the gospel before Jesus got there, preparing the way for Jesus. John has been imprisoned because of his testimony and eventually beheaded and thus martyred. And Jesus gets word of this, that his cousin, that John the Baptist has been beheaded, and Jesus just needed to go be alone. He just wanted to go be by himself for a little while, and I think talk to the Father and pray and meditate and just think about all of this. He just needed some alone time. So Jesus leaves the village that he's in, and he begins to go towards the wilderness area. He's just going out into the hills along the Sea of Galilee. That's where he did much of his ministry and the miracles, was right there at the Sea of Galilee. It's where so many of the little towns and villages were located. It's where the people lived. It's where they worked. But as Jesus gets outside of the the little village that he's in, somebody sees him, and Jesus, like the rock star he was, because wherever he went, miracles happened. A crowd begins to gather around Jesus, and he can't even go be by himself. And so that day, as we read in Matthew chapter 14, a large crowd gathers so loud, or so large as a matter of fact, that they say that there was 5,000 men, not including women and children. They were hungry that day, and, and uh, it was the challenge of the disciples to feed the 5,000. And so uh, out of the five loaves and the two fishes, Jesus and the disciples feed the multitudes that day. And so that's the backdrop. So Jesus, even though he wanted to be alone, is still not able to be alone in that day. And that's where we pick up our story in Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse number 22. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. In a boat they used. 
He made them get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. Jesus was saying, look, um, you guys get into the boat. Just go, and I'll meet you on the other side of the lake. Just go. Just, just be on your way, and I'll stay here. And he stayed, and he dismissed the crowds. I think this is where pastors get this from. When we stand at the back door and shake your hands, we love shaking your hands and greeting you and getting to know who you are. And Jesus did the same that day. Maybe standing along the beaten path back to the village as the people had been now well fed with probably the best fish and bread they've ever eaten. Jesus is there hugging and loving on the people and shaking hands and whatever kind of a greeting he gave. And while this is going on, the disciples have gone down to the shoreline. It's late in the day now. The sun is close to the horizon, if not already on the horizon. And they get into the boat, the 12 of them. A boat, uh, we don't know how big, maybe... uh, 20, 25 feet. It's a fishing boat, I would imagine. Full of nets, ropes, oars for the disciples to get their way across the lake. In verse number 23, it says, uh, After he had dismissed them, he went on a mountainside by himself to pray, and later that night, he was there alone. And so Jesus, uh, there, a silhouette upon the hillside, the sun has set. Maybe now the moon is shining and he's all by himself on the hillside crying out to Father God, maybe for the disciples in the boat out on the lake and maybe for himself in the loss of John the Baptist. The disciples were in the boat on the water. In verse number 24, it says the boat was already a a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. They're in the middle of this lake that is about uh, eight miles wide. It's still there today. You can travel to Israel and look at it. It's about eight miles wide at its widest point and about 13 miles long. And uh, apparently it was a windy night and the winds were buffeting. They were pushing against the boat. I don't know if they rowed the boat on the side like this. I think the boat was too big to do that. I think instead they probably sat somewhere in the middle and pulled at the oars. And pulled at the oars and pulled at the oars against the waves. As the gust of wind would come up, uh, I'm imagining they could feel the spray of the water in their faces, their clothes dampening with the water as the journey lengthens and the night goes on. Probably not a whole lot of conversation in the boat. The concentration is about how tired we are. We've just done ministry with Jesus all day. We were just with him when he fed uh, 5,000 people, and now he's asked us to get into the boat and cross to the other side. We're just tired. We're just tired. And so paints the setting for us of what is about to happen. Maybe, maybe in a starless sky is clouds cover. Uh, we don't know. Maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's a quarter moon. And so uh, what we see in the waters outside of the boat are the, the white caps painted silver by the light of the moon that night. We, we just don't know. And from a first-hand perspective, this is written when we get to verse number 25. Shortly before dawn, we read in other Gospels, it was after the third watch. It's between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Shortly before John, dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. Now, look, I know that we see a lot of stuff in Hollywood. (laughs) We see a lot of stuff in special effects, and we can maybe get a little bit jaded when we read God's Word, and you say, you know what, Pastor, this is a nice story. I don't believe this story. Look, just read the story. Hang on with me. You read a lot of stuff that you don't, that's not necessarily true, but you read it anyway. So just hold with me in the Bible here, okay? But Jesus went walking on the lake to them. I know, just let it sink in, right? But Jesus, here's what I know about Jesus. Jesus created the heavens and the earth and he created the lake. He's not, he's not subject to his own creation. He's the master of his creation. And so that night Jesus goes walking to them on the lake. Kind of cool, right? That's not what the disciples thought because you get to the next verse in verse number 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Well, don't get so excited. I mean, they were terrified, right? They see him walking on the lake. How would you respond if you're out boating out here on Lake Sakakawea? Late at night, the sun has set. You're just out there trolling around. Maybe it's the 4th of July and fireworks are going on, and somebody comes walking on the water. What would you be thinking? Right, somebody spiked my Pepsi. I don't know what you're thinking. Well, here's how they responded. 
The disciples in the boat said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I have a feeling that it's a ghost was not the only statement made in the boat that night. I'm thinking there was a lot of other things said there as well. And Jesus is close enough to them that they can hear their shouts of fear. And in verse number 27, it says, Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I, don't be afraid. Hey, guys, guys, don't be afraid. Because I'm thinking at that point, they're not going row anymore. They're going row, 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 faster, guys. You know, and Jesus is splashing on the water. Wait, keep on, I don't know, you know. He knows they're afraid. You don't see people walking on the water every day. Jesus came walking on the lake. You know there's a great little illustration or application for us in this. It's a stormy lake and they're working hard to get across to the other side. Jesus is in the lake. He's in the storms with us when we go through storms in life. And don't you think otherwise. And then, and then, and then as the story goes on, then Peter. I don't know if you read much about Peter. Peter. Let me tell you a little bit about Peter. Here's what I love about Peter. Uh, Peter was the guy who spoke first and thought later, you know? Uh, Peter's the guy that just had heel marks around his, around his mouth because he stuck his foot in it so much. Peter's the guy who said to Jesus, when Jesus said, look, who do people say that I am? Well, oh, you're Christ. You're the Son of God. And Jesus said, man, yeah, God revealed that to you. But I'm going to be crucified one day, and you need to know about that. And Peter's the one that said, no, 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 no. Don't let that happen to you. Nobody's going to kill you. I'll stand with you. And Jesus said, look, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have God's interests in mind. That's the Peter we're talking We're talking about the Peter, the Peter who, uh, who when all the disciples were there and, and Jesus was said, look, you're going to fall away when, when I get persecuted, when they arrest me and hang me on the cross, you're all going to run away. Peter's one said, I'll never run away. I'll stick with you through everything. And Jesus said, no, Peter, you need to know this. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. It's that Peter. And so here's Peter. Peter, the guy who spoke first, thought later. Peter, in verse number 28. When Jesus says, uh, don't be afraid, it's just me, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I just wonder as I read the story, did Peter say that? And then go, what did I just say? And the rest of the disciples are in the boat, if it's you, tell him to come walking on the water. And Peter again, just shooting off his mouth. I don't think he had a clue what he was saying. What would have possessed Peter to say that? Maybe, maybe, maybe for Peter, this was kind of a, we, we call it a fleece. He wanted a sign. Like, Jesus, if that's really you, I can trust you. I mean, I've seen you open blind eyes. I've seen you unstop deaf ears. I've seen you raise dead people back to life again. If it's really you, tell me to come walk into you on the water. And I just wonder what the dialogue was in the boat. Wouldn't it have been great to be there and just listen to that whole dialogue? I don't know if much was said. I can speculate in my mind as I read the story that maybe they're making fun of Peter a little bit. It's you, you come walking on the water. There he goes, shooting off his mouth again. And then Jesus, in verse number 29, says something profound. Look what he says. Come. I wonder if this is one of those moments when a million thoughts go through your mind in an instant. Because you just made this this amazing proclamation. If it's you, tell me to come walk into you on the water. And Jesus takes him to task and says, all right, come on. Just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. I knew it was you all the time, Jesus. Come on, get in the boat with me. That's not the way the story goes, though. I wonder if thoughts go through Peter's mind like, what did I just say? He told me to come. He invited me to get out of the boat. Gulp. (laughs) And the verse goes on in verse 29. Then Peter got down out of the boat. Can you imagine this? Feeling the rough wood of the side of that fishing boat. Up, down. Up, down. I know some of you are getting sick, aren't you? Up, down. One leg over the side of the boat. I wanted to get a boat up here this morning. Didn't work out. One leg over and he's feeling the rough wood of that boat. Looking back at the other disciples in the boat. And they're probably just going... 
<laughs> you said it, not us, you know. Other leg over the side of the boat, chest on the side of the boat, reaching down. You can feel the water. Looking at the disciples going, you know. And he started walking towards Jesus on the water. And every time you read this, you have to go, that is so cool. I remember hearing this story when I was in Sunday school, and I thought, I'm going to try walking on water too. But you know what? I did it at the indoor swimming pool in Williston, North Dakota, in the shallow end, because I'm going to play it safe, even if I am going to try to walk on water, right? Right? And in North Dakota, we walk on water a lot. It's called ice fishing. There you go. So, okay. <laughs> Here's the incredible thing as I read the story. Listen to me, church. Peter left the safe place. He left the safe place in the boat to be in the best place in the presence of Jesus. He left the safe place to be in the best place. He got out of the boat and he walks on water. He's walking on water. I would just wonder if the other 11 disciples are in the boat going... I wish I would have thought of that. I mean, haven't you ever watched somebody or they invented something or they wrote a book and, you know, it's a bestseller, it's an incredible thing, and you can buy it on TV, it's a Ronco product or whatever, I don't care what it is. It's like, that is so simple. I could have invented that. And you're just almost mad because you didn't. Why didn't I think of that? You've all said that, didn't you? Why didn't I think of that? Well, Peter not only thought of it, but he did it too. And the other, other disciples, I just wonder if they're sitting in the boat going, oh, I wish this is one time I shot my mouth off and did it. Because here's the incredible thing. If there were 12 guys in the boat that night, only one of them is mentioned by name in the story. Peter. The guy who did it. <laughs> well, you know, when you get out of the boat and you start walking in places by faith, it can get scary sometimes. And it got scary for Peter, too. Verse number 30. Uh, when, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And this is a place where I've heard preachers preach, and I've heard people say, you know what? Peter, Peter failed here. I mean, he started to sink. His faith wavered, and he started to sink into the water. I'm thinking Peter didn't fail at all. You know who I think failed in this story? The 11 guys who were content to play it safe and sit in the boat. I think Peter was a success story. Peter's the one that initiated it. And on Jesus' invitation, he gets out of the boat, and he's the only one out of the twelve that walked on the water. I think it's a success story. I think it's the very thing that Theodore Roosevelt talked about in the quote that I read to you earlier. I, I think that's what it's all about. And when you step out in faith and you start walking in a direction that God might call you to, and for you it might be the, the ending of a relationship or the beginning of a relationship. For you it might be the, the saying, you know what, God, you've given me incredible resources of money. And for a long time I, I, thought, I thought this money was my place of security. I thought this is the thing that's going to carry me through. But Lord, I'm just feeling that I need to give towards your work. For you it might be, you know what, I don't care what people say about me in the workplace. I'm going to play Christian radio anyway. I don't care what they say about me in school. I'm going to carry my Bible anyway. I don't care what they say about me. I'm still going to talk about Jesus. In the culture and the society that we live, when they say it's wrong to speak out against certain lifestyles, I'm going to say what Jesus would say on the subject. I'm not going to cower to conformity. I'm going to step out of the boat. I'm not going to cower back into familiarity or routine. I'm going to be true to my personal convictions. And that's exactly what Peter did here. And out of the boat. And then he looks at the waves. He looks at the waves and uh, he got scared. <laughs> well, before you're too tough on him, you go try to walk on a lake sometime and see how it goes for you. <laughs> I would have done it barefoot because I want to feel what the water's like under my feet. <laughs> he left the place of safety and it was scary. And it took courage and it took faith. But there was a reward for it. Look at verse number 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. 
There's the reward. He took the step of faith. The other guys, they're already sitting in the boat. They don't have to worry about this. But at this moment in time, you know there's only one out of the twelve that's in the embrace of Jesus. The only one in the embrace of Jesus is the guy who stepped out of the boat. The only one who's discovering the power of Jesus over the elements, the circumstances around him, is the one guy, Peter, that steps out of the boat. The only guy enjoying the embrace of Jesus is the one who left the place of safety. The only one discovering more about the character and the nature and the ability and the love of Jesus. Christ is the guy who got out of the boat. (laughs) What's keeping you in your boat? (laughs) It's a great story. And then and then I just as I read this in my mind's eye, I have a feeling I read the Bible different than some of you. But I'm thinking as Jesus, Jesus looks at Peter out on the lake. I don't know, I I don't know how this begins sinking. What does begin sinking mean? Is he ankle deep in water? Is he knee deep in water? I mean, is he just kind of bobbing like a cork in the water? We don't know. I mean. What's going on? And he's out there in the water. And then I think Jesus, with a smile on his face, said, Peter, you have little faith. I think Peter was having fun for a while, don't you? And then, and then Jesus has another question. Why did you doubt? Uh, maybe because I've never walked on water before. I don't know. You know? <laughs> but I think the question is for us. When you start being obedient to God in the area of finances and relationships and lifestyle and habits and decision making and choices, and you know what the Word of God says, you know that Jesus is standing there. He's made the invitation. He says, come, just be obedient. There's blessings that follow obedience. And we get scared, and he says, why did you doubt? It's a good question. Really, what he's saying to Peter is, look, Peter, you knew I was right here. Why did you get scared? It's going to be oh. Okay. When he got out of the boat, Jesus took hold of him. And you know what he found when he got out of the boat? He left the safest place to be what I think was in the best place. Because you know what the best place was? The best place was, who do you think had the better story? The guys in the boat or Peter? I think Peter had the better story. And I think it was the better place to be, not only for the story that he could tell, but because of what he encountered and who he discovered and feeling the embrace of Jesus in the middle of the lake. So sometimes the safest place isn't always the best place. And if Jesus gives you the invitation, you say, Lord, if this is you, i got to know it's you. Just tell me to do this. And he says, do it. Well, then do it. Now, how that looks specifically for you, you can open up the Bible and find a lot of stuff there. It's amazing when you say, God, what is the wise thing to do here? I don't know what to do. What's the wise thing to do? He'll give you the answer almost faster than you want it. And you know what's fun about preaching this message to you? It's going to be fun to watch how you guys respond to this and implement it in your life. And the other fun thing about it is it's just fun to preach because it's easy to preach, but it's hard for me to do. Because <laughs> I get challenged in the same place as you do. In areas of personal growth. Stepping out of the boat. I thought long and hard about stories of my own personal life. Stepping out of the boat and taking steps of faith and moving in obedience of God. And There were some that came. And yet, you know what's interesting is, is so many times when we make what we think are big decisions, or big choices in following God, We still want to play it safe because we're scared. I I don't know what it is for you. I I don't know today what you're dealing with, what your boat of security is. Because all of us, all of us have boats, okay? All of us have a boat. And we like to pad our boat. We like to put as many amenities in our boat. We like to make our boat as comfortable as possible. We try to make it into like a a luxury boatel, okay? I, I don't know. We just want to make it what it can possibly, we want to make it as comfortable as we possibly can. And so, your, your safety place is different than mine. Like I said, for some of you, it's conformity, it's familiarity, it's, uh, it's doing what everybody else does so as to be accepted by all. For some of you, your, your boat is your money. For some of you, it's your title. For some of you, it's your family. For some of you, it's the way that you live and the lifestyle that you've come accustomed to. All of us have different looking boats. For some of you, it's your job. It might be... Your mother, your dad, all of us have different boats. Um, Your boat might be just self-acceptance. That's your boat. 
And the whole thing I read about spiritual life and growing in Jesus Christ is that we're always challenged to get out of our boat, to leave the safe places, to get into the best place, and there enjoy the embrace of Jesus Christ. Well, not that Jesus isn't in the boat too. But as I read the story, I thought, man, I would have loved to have been Peter that night. It would have been an exciting time. So what, what keeps you from getting out of the boat? I think I know what it is. Um, let's see. Let, let me tell you what keeps me in my boat. Fear. Selfishness. Fear. Selfishness. Oh, and did I tell you about being afraid? <laughs> and selfishness. There's where the battle is, isn't it, church? Um... But imagine this, imagine this, imagine this. Can you imagine, we're just about done, the exhilaration. Can you imagine the exhilaration of walking on the water? Peter had a story. Can you imagine when Peter gets home and he tells his wife and children, guess what I did last night? I walked on the water. Yeah, whatever, Dad. No, really, I did. Let me tell you the story. And you know the incredible thing about Peter? Peter steps out of the boat and he walks on the water. This is the Peter, this is the Peter that we will read about on one day, on one day, when the Holy Spirit descended on a group of people who had been in a prayer service, now empowered by God, stands up before 3,000 people, preaches the Word of God, and they all come to faith. This is the Peter who walks into the temple courts one day, sees a guy who's laying there lame and says, you know what, I don't have any money to give you, but I'm going to give you what I got. I wonder if he's referring back to even an experience he had while on the lake. If Jesus can let me walk on water, then in Jesus' name, rise up and walk. And he stands up and walks. That's the Peter, I'm just telling you. This built his faith to go out and step onto the water and walk. How exhilarating it would be for us when, if, we get out of the boat and we start walking on the water. You can't walk on water when you stay in the boat. I know. It's pretty deep stuff, isn't it? It's just the case. It's just the reality. But how exciting it is when we take a step of faith, a step of obedience, and we don't even know what's ahead. Look, you guys do it all the time. You guys, you guys here's the thing. We'll hold back. We'll kind of pull back a little bit from being obedient with God because we don't know what's on the other side of saying yes. But you'll go to a theme park and ride some bizarre, crazy roller coaster that'll shake, rattle, and roll you all over the place. And you don't know if you're going to come out alive on the other end, but you'll go on that. Because there's a certain thrill about the ride because you don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm telling you, get on and get in and prepare for the ride when you start saying yes to Jesus in certain places in your life. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If, 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 if you were one of the 12 disciples that night and Jesus is out here in the water. Sorry, you're all in the water this morning. He's in the water and you're in the boat and you want to be with Jesus, where would you want to be? I want to be where Jesus is, right? So what keeps you in the boat? Fear? Selfishness? Maybe there's a whole bunch of other answers. I don't know, but you know.